do it to it. <laughs> it's going fantastic. Okay, so we're going to make a start. Thank you all for being here. Thank you most of all, um, Dr. Guillermo Grenier. You can see in the chat that I've introduced him for you. Um, he has a very, very eminent career so far, and it's going in in uh, in a more eminent direction still. So he's a professor of sociology. <laughs> Um, and Chair of the Department of Global and Sociocultural Studies at Florida International University. Um, Guillermo has many research projects. Um, one of the ones that I didn't know about actually is that he has worked with Cubans on the Ruta del Cimarron in Cuba. And there's uh, some research coming out of that as well, which is very interesting. But today he's gonna to be talking to us about a regular part of his work as a sociologist. Um, based in Florida, and that is the Cuba poll that he's been working on since 1991. So Guillermo, you're in charge of your PowerPoint. I can be there as backup. Over to you, and thank okay, you so great. much for making it today. Thank you so much. Everybody can hear me fine. Everybody can see me fine at the time for the time being. And now I'm going to share the screen. Oops, no, I've not got to share the screen first. Um, there we go. Share that screen and then do this. And you guys should be able to see a. A PowerPoint, correct? Or no? Yeah, it's there. OK, you, you can see it, right? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm trying see, to. See. I'm trying to find the beginning of the mother. Of the we thing. can see it. It's looking. It's looking very clear. We can see it. it's fine. Okay, great. Okay, I need to have some verification of that, and then I'm going to go back to the beginning of it, because uh, as thank you, Pars, for the invitation. Thank you, folks from the uh, uh, Cuba Research Forum for having me and um, and like Par mentioned, this is my day job. This is what I do. Uh, like once every couple of years, I, I actually have a job and it's to analyze the, the results of a Cuba poll. Now I do this as part of my ongoing research in general um, on the Cuban American population in the United States, which my, my research started out quite broad years ago as uh, looking at uh, capitalism in the United States and there to, uh, to uh, labor in the United States uh, and its uh, conflicts with capitalism. Then it narrowed to immigration when I moved to Miami. And now it's gotten like really narrow to so Cuban Americans in, uh, in Florida because um, although I try to um, um, contextualize the importance of Cuban Americans by saying that there really nobody should be that interested in Cuban Americans in the United States. They're a minuscule percentage of the population. Every four years, they become los bravos de la película. They become the, the heroes of the, of the movie because they mostly live in, in Florida and they mostly uh, vote Republican in an area that's mostly democratic, the south of, 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 of the southern part of Florida. So everybody is interested in Cubans um, beyond their size of the pop, kind of like the interest that we all have in Cuba, a tiny island in the Caribbean, and it's, it's way blown be, uh, beyond any kind of objective proportions how important that island is this, in this day and age, but a lot of us still consider it very important. Um, the title of my presentation today is kind of a, um, what I'd, I'd like to kind of focus on, which is we have the Trump phenomenon, which hopefully is gonna run out of steam regardless of, of how he thinks about it, or whether he concedes or not in a, in a couple of months. And then you have a Republican party that has become part of the Cuban American identity. And then you have Cuban Americans and it's all one big Kumbaya love story that uh, creates a, a dynamic in South Florida that's quite unique in um, in the United States politics uh, at the moment. So uh, I want to, uh, oops, let me um, turn on my clicker here. I wanna give you a little overview of the Cuba poll real quickly. Uh, we'll have times, plenty of times for questions and answers hopefully afterwards. But the Cuba poll is a scientifically um, designed survey to use probabilistic uh, sampling. Uh, in this case, we've got 1,002 randomly selected Cuban Americans in, in South Florida. 
um, we were shooting for a thousand, three people were on the phone at the same time, we got a thousand too. Uh, it's a telephone survey. It's a survey that is unusual in in its in its complexity in a way, but more unusual than that is the fact that Cuban Americans are very eager to answer it. We have a ninety percent re, uh, uh, response rate on a phone survey that's about 20, 20, 25 minutes long, and that's unheard of in survey research in research in general. So it's it's quite a um, uh, quite a project that is received pretty well in, in the community. Uh, the the results that you're going to see are way to be representative of the community in general. It's a, a probability sample that we can weigh, and uh, the margin of error is is 3.1. So if, for the, those of you that uh, have a, wonder what that is, is that we are 95 percent certain. But if you were to ask every one of these questions to every single Cuban in South Florida, we would, whatever number you see on the screen, you subtract 3% or you add 3%. And every Cuban, if we interviewed every single Cuban in Miami, the answer would be within that range. We're 95% certain. So it's a pretty good margin of error. Uh, this is the largest poll on Cuban Americans. Uh, and this is the 14th that we've conducted. Um, every couple of years since in the early 90s. Now the presentation, it, it's, it's a lot of information. So I wanna give you the framework, the structure that doesn't change from slide to slide. One is that uh, th there are four categories. In every slide, you're gonna see four bars and one, one, four sets of bars, total responses. Uh, that's a general population. So when I say, you know, that 70% of the Cubans in Miami have somebody living on the island, that will be in the top uh, of the bars. And then we have the other three response categories are, we break that question down by age. And we have four age categories that you'll see. And then we break it down by migration period. Migration periods we divide between uh, uh, before 1995 and after 1995. Uh, and then the third one being born outside of of Cuba, either in the United States or another country. The, uh, and then the other category that we break down of each question by is voter registration. W whether you, what part of your, your, your um, registered in, and we also put under there, if, you, if you're not a citizen, which means you can't be registered to vote if you're not a citizen. So this is an example, it's an interesting slide and all that, but it's an example of what, of, uh, I bring it in as an example because I want you to, to, to get used to looking at the slides. So you can see in the top, the top two um, um, bars, the top, top one, I, I sometimes put, I always put in the don't knows, just in case you wanna know how many people didn't answer, or maybe sometimes that don't know makes sense to you conceptually as an answer. Like you wanna raise the embargo, I don't know. I mean, you, you support the embargo, I don't know. You know, so sometimes you might, there might be a, a category. So on the top, we put, I put the totals with the don't knows. And then in the bottom, in the top, in the next bar down, I take out the don't knows. In this case, it's only one, so it doesn't really change the totals. After that, we have the age categories uh, up to 39. And then by 10 year increments roughly, but you know, you can see in 60 to 75, et cetera. And then the three migration categories before 1995, 95, and after and not born in Cuba, and then the political um, alliances that include non-citizen down there. So here um, you, can, and, uh, you can see that 92% of the non-citizens, which always translates into the most recent arrivals, the non-citizens have, 92% uh, of them have somebody back on the island. Um, the, another thing that I want you to keep uh, uh, an eye on is this 50% mark because I'll be giving you a lot of information. And if you keep track of this 50% line, you'll be quickly able to see if the majority or a minority of the people support any specific uh, policy that I'm, or any specific uh, policy that I'm mentioning. For example, um, when did you come to the United States? This, 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 this slide shows you all the colors that I'll be using is like the spectrum. Um, 
this is here you can see that 50% of the population, um, uh, 51% to be exact, said that they came to the United States for political reasons, right? Um, but then when you look down here uh, at the di different categories, you can see that 40 per only 40% of the folks coming before 1995 stated that as a category. Now, I, I, I haven't analyzed this figure, this uh, variable, and I put it here more as an example. It's an interesting example. It's got a lot of things going, but uh, I'm not happy with the question, and I don't know how to to analyze it yet. I mean, I do the, um, but anyway, that I, here I'm using it as an example, but I am, I do quote it often. To, to point that uh, the exile idea, the idea that humans are all exiles, died some time ago, and that this is some empirical evidence of that, that uh, political reasons are not the reasons people are coming. They're coming for improve your life, family reunification, career opportunities, et cetera. All right. So again, if you keep an eye on this 50, 50 uh, percent line, you'll be able to quickly see that non-citizens mostly are coming over for family reunification and that uh, the folks that are older came over for political reasons as did the 1995 um, before 1995. So it's a kind of a, a quick way you can uh, gather and we can always discuss them, of course. Now, there are a lot of patterns that come up and I'm just gonna mention three of them, uh, two major ones, which is in all of these variables that I that I uh, tell you about, how people responded to policy issues, how they'd like the US and Cuba to behave towards one another, mostly US behaving towards Cuba. Um, the older respondents towards the old end, the pre-1995 immigrants and the registered Republicans cluster together. So there's a lot of overlap among those categories, right? But uh, when you analyze them, you have to pull them out individually. Those things kind of, th those three categories kind of support isolationist policies. If you had to bet, you, you would win more money than you'd lose. If you see an old Cuban walking towards you and you ask him when you came and you came, he says 1970, and, uh, and you're asking what Republican, are you Republican or Democrat? And they say Republican, you can probably bet that that guy is pro embargo and more isolationist in his policies and you'd win money more times than you'd lose it. Same thing with younger respondents, Cuban Americans born outside of Cuba and registered Democrats. They cluster together towards more engagement uh, policies uh, um, def defaults. The non-citizens, they're all over the place in many ways, but you'll see that they mostly cluster again on the more supportive engagement policies. And we'll, we can talk about how this survey shows different trends in the community later on. Now, let's contextualize Cuban population in South Florida for a second. For, you might not be as, uh, as uh, familiar with this as a lot of the other audiences that have done this for. At the national level, this top uh, um, bar here, at the national level, Cubans constitute a minuscule amount, 0.7% of the population. At the Florida level, Cubans are 72% of the Florida population are Cuban American. Uh, and 18% uh, are other Hispanics, and then the rest of the folks are non-Hispanic. In Miami-Dade County is where Cubans rule, right? They, they are the largest ethnic group. They're 36.3% of the population. That's larger than any other single ethnic group by a long sh shot, because other Hispanics come from every country in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, Non-Hispanics come from every country in the world practically, right? So Cubans are outnumber all those pan-ethnic pan categories by just in their numbers, just Cuban Americans. So it's, it's by far it's the, the, the tail that wa wags the dog here. Um, this is a, a uh, just to give you confidence in my in the polling. The po our poll, by the way, was the only one that called the uh, not that I it was a political poll per se, but it it called the Cuban vote on the money <laughs> um, it, for Trump. It was the only one that did that, and it's because we sweat the details on the methodology. There you can see 
Uh, here are the categories that we use in our analysis. The, the, the first numbered column is the census, the US census, as it's updated in the American Community Survey. And then the last column is the Cuba poll, our weighted uh, estimates based on our, our random sampling or probability sample. So you can see how close, if you go across, you can see how close these two numbers are. And that means we, our population is truly representative of the Cuban American population in Miami-Dade County. I mean, the numbers could not be closer. The only thing that we have uh, somewhat of a discrepancy in is um, race. And it's, and it's because we are more inclusive. We don't ask uh, a simple race question. We say, okay, what do you consider yourself? And we let them say whatever they wanna say. And then, then, we, then we code it afterwards. So you only have 80% white, where the census says you got 95% white Cubans. And it's because um, we actually give more, more, more choices there. Uh, now, these are the numbers that we're talking about. And I know this is a lot of info that you probably could, you could not care less about, but uh, I think it's, it's interesting nevertheless. This last category, Miami-Dade category, is the world that we're living in right here. Um, all of these numbers, all these numbers, Republican, Democrat, other total registered vote, these are registered voters and all of the numbers are hard numbers. That is the state of Florida registered numbers, numbers except for the Cubans because we don't break, the United States doesn't break down uh, um, voting categories by that fine grain of, of home ethnicity. They, they stick all Hispanics together. So in Miami-Dade County, you can see that there are 294,000 Hisp uh, Hispanic Republicans and 253,000 of those are Cuban American, right? So, or 54,000 rounding up. So the Cuban uh, estimate is based on our polling. It's, it's, so we, we, we do a, a sample of the population, then draw an estimate how many Cubans are are, uh, are registered because we get the census and we have the hard numbers of registration figures. But anyway, that's for you methodology, the, the, the two methodologists in the group, which I don't even know there are that many usually. Um, all right, but here we get why Miami-Dade County becomes important. Even though Biden won the county, right? The, the South Florida area all went blue. All, all, the, all the political divisions, Palm Beach County, Broward County, Miami-Dade County, all went blue, all went Democrat. Um, the reason that, it, that uh, uh, it goes Democrat is because you'll see here that non-Hispanics, 56% 50, of non-Hispanics are Democrats. 38% of, of other Hispanics are Democrats. 26% of Cubans are Democrats. But 52%, 53% of Cubans are Republican. So the, the plan for the Republican Party has never been to win Miami-Dade County because it doesn't matter if they win Miami-Dade County in a presidential race, the, only the state total matters. So they can, if they can get all of those Republican Cubans voting Republican and a lot of these independents, which in Miami, they actually, independents, no party affiliations actually vote um, Republican, they vote like Republicans, then they cut down the entire state's margin of victory uh, for the or margin for the Democrats and they end up winning the state like they did this year and they did last time uh, for Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton, they only won 100 by 112,000 votes. The Republicans only won uh, Florida by 112,000 votes uh, during Clinton's run of Trump triple that, uh, he won by 370,000 votes. They're still counting technically. All right, so let's look specifically at some policies towards Cuba and how the uh, population has, has um, the opinion of the population towards those policies. Every year since 1991, we've been asking, do you think the embargo has worked? And every year Cubans say, hell no. You know, we, we might be intransigent, but we're not come uh, mierda, right? You know, we know when something doesn't work and this one um, doesn't work. 
but we don't ask them why they think that, right? We don't, I think a couple of times we have, but it's, 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 just, we just, it might be that they laugh at the embargo because it's not really an embargo. They can get Coke in Venezuela or whatever, or they really think that it, it hasn't worked for regime change or whatever. We don't ask them, we don't probe it. But clearly most Cubans over 70 some percent 71% recognize the embargo has not worked. Now, when we ask those same Cubans, do you favor or oppose continuing the embargo? You can see that little red line moving way past the 50% mark. You have a 60% of the respondents support continuing the embargo if, if you don't include the don't knows as an answer. If you include it, it goes a little bit down to 54%. Um, so you have a majority of Cubans supporting the embargo. And this we'll see later is a change from the Obama period, but it's not a change from the last, the significant change from the last poll that we did during uh, Trump's period, which was two years ago. But here you see again, the patterns that I was mentioning to you about. The non-Cuba borns, uh, the Cuban Americans, the Democrats, and the younger voters here are still pro-embargo, but they're the closest of the age group not to be for the embargo. So that's the clustering effect that I uh, that I mentioned earlier. This is the big picture, 60% when you don't consider don't know as an answer. If you break it down by pre-1995 and post-1995, uh, plus everybody else, all the Cuban Americans born uh, outside of Cuba, then you get closer to 50% mark. So you have, um, of, we're, they're not making any more of these, right? They're not making any more people before 1995. Where they're making a lot more of the other groups. So I think that that's the, the, uh, the tendency of the, of the trend. Now, this is a long-term trend that we'll get to in the, at the end of the uh, presentation, because this is one of the takeaways that might, um, that hopefully will influence the, when I do my presentation to the Democratic Party in a couple of weeks, they'll influence the way they look at their, their, their leadership now. This is a, this just shows you that leadership matters and we're gonna get back to it. You can see where after the Obama um, uh, elections, the red line is in support for the embargo. You can see that it went way down. The 60% that they have now went way, that was way down at 34% support for the embargo when Obama left office. Um, my bet guess is that if, if Hillary had, had won, would be hovering around there now, maybe a little bit less because they would not, you know, the, the idea of the embargo would raise again, uh, its head as in, in importance, but the Democrats would deal with it somewhat differently than, than the Republicans would. And here you see the, 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 uh, the line for support of diplomatic relations. During the Obama years, it went up, it kept going up after the established diplomatic relations. And during the Trump years has gone down. So that now both numbers are very close. Both uh, trend lines meet, are meeting at 50 and 60%. So leadership matters. Whoever's in the White House writing the, writing the rules, Cubans will follow. And I'll have more to say on that in, in a minute. Uh, other economic relations, uh, the, even though they support the embargo, Cubans dominantly and overwhelmingly support uh, temporarily suspending the sanctions of the embargo while the uh, COVID crisis occurs. Let me, let me get this, rid of this thing here. While the COVID crisis is working its way through, Cubans support the um, um, suspension of the embargo by, by quite a bit, you know, by 61% of the respondents. As many people support the uh, 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 support the, the embargo as support the um, suspension of the embargo due to COVID. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Support selling food uh, to Cuba overwhelmingly. This has been always been the case. Selling medicine to Cuba overwhelmingly. Uh, the Cuban Americans support that. Cruise ships, not so much. The continuation of cruise ships, uh, all except the young. Uh, the youngest are 50-50, 18 to 39. Not Cuba-born support the opening of the cruise ships. The Democrats, 
and the non-citizens support opening of the uh, of the cruise ships but all other groups are clearly in opposition some general policy approaches that are not specific uh, to to cuba but I mean, it, national so the question of whether cuba poses a threat to the american vital interest only the oldest uh, there are three categories, the ones that I told you grouped together, the oldest Republicans and folks before 1995 actually say that, yes, not in overwhelming numbers, but in substantial majority, that Cuba does pose an, a, a vital interest to, to uh, a threat to American vital interest. Um, now, we have two questions that we've always kind of asked one way or the other, just to see, uh, and I call them the carrot and the stick questions because one is the stick, this is the stick. If we ask uh, folks, uh, some people say that the US government should emphasize policies that um, uh, maximize pressure on the Cuban government to promote regime change, using that word regime change, you get a lot of folks supporting that. Everybody supports that. Even freaking Democrats support that. So, you know, the, the, we're, we're like one party system with two wings. But the um, the the same the, so that's the stick. But if you ask the same people if they would consider then um, policies that are specifically designed to improve directly improve the economic well being of Cuban people, they also say yes. Overwhelmingly say yes. See the blue. Uh, the blue always is a, a pro engagement color and red is a, a, a uh, anti engagement color, but you can see that overwhelmingly every category says you, should, you can focus on policies to improve the economic well being of, of Cuban people. So basically, tell us, you know, choose one, do it, <laughs> and you will get some, bottle it correctly and you will get support from the, from the Cuban population in Miami Dade County when it, the policy is directed at either the government or the Cuban people specifically. Uh, support for maintaining diplomatic relations, 58% of the entire population and just about everybody except for the folks before 1995 and the Republicans, Republicans are hard nuts to crack on this, um, support maintaining diplomatic relations. Uh, the agree with the suspension of the issuing of visas because the you know there are no consular services in, in at the embassy in Havana. Most folks disagree with that, right? The blue shows that they disagree. They strongly disagree with the suspension. That means that they want the reanudar. Uh, they want to um, continue or retake, uh, reestablish the, uh, the consular services in Havana, except for the folks that came between 1990, before 1995, they're right on the cusp. Remember 3%. Wet foot, dry foot policy, I had to ask, and uh, the population is pretty much split, but most folks don't want, uh, they oppose reinstatement, but it's 57% support reinstatement of wet foot, dry foot, and 53% oppose reinstatement. So you have the 3% error kind of overlaps there. So your population is pretty much split, split on the issue of, of wet foot, dry foot, which Obama kind of changed on his way out the door. So Hillary wouldn't do it, but didn't quite work out that way. Um, support for the suspension of the family reunification parole program. Trump has suspended it. People want it back, except for the old folks who don't have anybody there, except for the people between before 1995 and before um, and, and, and the Republicans. All the other groups want the reestablishment of the family reunification program. Support for unrestricted travel for all Americans. This is the first time in many years that the support support for unrestricted travel has gone under. 50%. Normally, that is one of the bellwether um, kind of uh, measures of desires to open up, letting other Americans go to Cuba. Now, this is this is um, the, the, the hard line is manifested here pretty directly. 
except again for, for some categories like the very young, not Cuba born, Democrat, et cetera. Remittances, about 50%, 48% send remittances to relatives on the island. And um, the Western Union closing is going to have an impact on that. But it's, it does show that sending of remittances was fairly widespread across the entire populations, including the folks not born in Cuba. The, uh, Cuban Americans, about a quarter of those, sent stuff back to, to the money back to the island. So you have a, uh, a, a, a popu that's another one of the mangos bajos in terms of policy. If you could just reinstate remittances, that would receive a lot of support within the Cuban American population. Have you traveled? Over 50, 53% have, uh, even a quarter, over a quarter of Cuba, non-Cuba born Cuban Americans have. Um, and of course the non-citizens uh, pretty much have frequent flyer miles back and forth. Uh, and perhaps because of that, there's an overwhelming support of airlines to establish services to all regions of the island as opposed to just Havana. The um, um, the support is, let me uh, put me over here. The, um, the support is widespread, that, uh, believing that if you're gonna fly to the island, fly everywhere, not just to Havana. Now I wanna look at, uh, Cubans are, are considered to be one issue voters, you know, Cuba, you know, address, come down here and talk about Cuba, like all political candidates do, and that's what swings the Cuban vote. But it's not the case. It's never been the case as far as we've been polling. When we ask people what their issues are that motivates them to vote, and I'll tell you what, how we did it this time, it doesn't matter how many issues I put on the, on the menu, whether I have 10 or I have five, like I have here, six, like I have here. Um, Cuba is always near the end, or the end. You know, it's either the last one or next to last in terms of issues that motivate you to work, to, to vote. So Cubans don't necessarily, Cuba, of course, resonates with Cubans. It's the only place in the country where it does resonate. So yeah, you're right to come down here and talk about Cuba, because nobody else will care in West Virginia if you talk about Cuba. But down here, yeah, they will. Um, but there are other issues that Cubans are interested in, and I think that that's the, the, the hidden message, which I haven't explored at a, to its depth, is what other issues in the, in the Republican Party also attracts Cubans. Uh, people always say welfare, I mean, uh, taxes. Well, it could be racism. You know, it could be a lot of other stuff, right? But in, in, if I give these, these on, the, uh, on these slides, the left-hand side of your slide is the total for the entire population. That's not gonna change as I go through these three categories ahead of me here. You, so you can see here that the economy, blue, healthcare, orange or whatever the color is, gray is race relations, immigration is, is yellow, blue is China policy, and green is Cuba policy. So if China kind of by a whisker, beats to, to Cuba as an important motivator of, uh, to vote for the, um, uh, for the Cuban Americans. So the economy, so this poll by the I mean, this categorization doesn't look too much different as the categorization that Gallup has of people in the nation in general uh, or in Ohio or in Indiana or in any other state. So you have a, uh, a situation where Cuba is, yeah, it resonates, but it might not be the issue people vote on. And so, um, so let's think about that. So by the age, here you can see that, uh, again, age for the elderly, healthcare is more important than the economy. Makes sense. Um, Cuba for the elderly is more important than for any other group, than, than, than China. <laughs> In China, right? But for every other group, uh, Cuba is dead last in terms of importance uh, of, of the issues in terms of, of key issues that motivate them. Migration wave, pretty much the same. Um, 
uh, the migration since 1995, Cuba beats out China and is part of almost as close as immigration, which I guess is, we can bundle those together conceptually. Uh, the new, the non Cuba borns uh, don't think Cuba is that important. They've left that place and uh, are here now. And so they're more concerned about the economy and some other issues. Um, and voter registration. So here's where you see some very similar numbers to, um, to the country in general. Republicans are more interested in the economy. Democrats are more interested in healthcare. Uh, Non-citizens is pretty much the same. Both of things, economy and healthcare is very tied together, no kidding. In the United States, you can't have health insurance unless you pay, uh, unless you're employed at a decent rate. Um, and then Cuba as for the non-citizens is um, more important just when you look at voter registration. All right, so let's look at it, Senor Trump and his handling of key national issues and how Cubans, this is the part of the love story that's very kind of get your hankies out because this is really emotional. The, um, uh, they love Trump's handling of the immigration issue, right? 64% support the way that President Trump has handled the issue of immigration. Cubans, you know, we don't need no stinking immigration. In general, that's the tendency has always been to downplay immigration as a Cuban problem, just because Cuba has always had this very cozy and very personal relationship with the state, with the state United States that has treated them very differently. So, but here you can see the support fine, uh, except for the young Cubans, except for the Democrats, uh, everybody's pretty much in, uh, in, 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 uh, in approval of President Trump's handling of that. And then healthcare, you might ask me, any, any, anybody in the United States would ask me, what has he done for healthcare? Well, whatever he's done, um, they like it. And uh, the not Cuban born and Democrats are the ones that stand out. And I don't have this slide here because a friend of mine just sent it to me, but there's a, on Flagler Street, there's this big sign of, of an HMO, HMO that talks about Obamacare and on one side of the sign, a picture of Obama, presidential pose with a flag in the back. On the other side of the flag is a picture of Trump in his presidential uh, pose with a flag in the back. So for Cubans, healthcare is healthcare. It doesn't, uh, Obamacare, that we have the highest uh, enrollment for Obamacare in the country, in Hialeah specifically. Um, so Trump might get credit for not dismantling it. I don't know, but whatever it is, they, they're on, to, on the Trump bandwagon on healthcare, as well as race relations. Even though this is a bit more mixed review, you have the young Cuban Americans that do not support, um, the, the Cubans not born on the island, don't think he's doing a great job on race relations. And Cubans that are young don't think that he's doing a great job on race relations. Neither do independent voters and neither do Democrats. So there he gets a mixed review on race relations, but he kind of gets uh, the same category, the same ca categories don't approve of the way he's handled the, the nationwide protests, which every once in a while still flare up, but where the, 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 the only thing cooking in the summer um, but still, you can see that there's support for his handling of that across a significant number of the population. And the Cuba policy, except for non-Cuba borns and uh, Democrats, even non-citizens, the newest arrival from Cuba, um, support his handling of the Cuba policy, which is basically tightening the ratchet, right? So uh, I have a lot of friends who tell me why this non-citizen group is so uh, enamored with Trump's policies and it all hinges on bitterness and dis disappointment and a lot of the things that they left behind that they just kind of don't wanna deal with, with. But I don't know if that's true, I have not researched it, but it's a, it's a good hypothesis as any. China policy, um, La China, Okay, so you've got Democrats that are against it, but every other group is pretty much for it, whatever that means to them. 
it brings jobs mostly. It means jobs. The core, when you do the correlations every time you have economy and China's uh, concerns, you see that China equals jobs. Um, the COVID-19 crisis, 83%, uh, what is it? So 65% uh, uh, support the, the handling of, of his uh, COVID, of the COVID crisis. Now here, let me tangentially mention something to you. Um, no, I'll, I'll wait later, I, I, I'm running behind. The economy, everybody loves the freaking economy. Economy, uh, even 46% of Democrats like his economy. So, um, so yeah. Politics writ large, this is a self-assigning um, me measure of conservatism and liberalism. We ask Cubans to, to, on a scale of one to seven, one being most conservative, one be, seven being the most liberal, put yourself in there. And only the Democrats go over the halfway point of, 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 mid, of mid range even, you know, like moderacy. So yeah, Cubans are conservative. So it's, it's, the issue is, a, is not how conservative can you be as an issue of, of, of specific issues. Citizenship, uh, Cubans are, they enroll, I mean, they sign up, they, 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 they do their, their stint as residents and they sign up to be um, uh, citizens as quickly as possible. Only the, the, the group that has come from 2010 um, has not um, become a, become citizens, and actually, I should say, 2010 or 2015. Um, registered voters: red is Republican, blue is Democrat, independent, uh, no party affiliation, or whitish. You can see this is the the one element that stands out when I do my comparisons over the years. Uh, up to uh, uh, up to now, <clears throat> if I were to break this a little bit earlier, I, I would get the same results. Up to now, uh, most early arrivals, the most the, the, the most recent arrivals, I should say, have signed when the when they could sign up to register either Republican, either Democrat or Independent. Let me say that again. Until very recently, the most recent arrivals registered Democrat or Independent, mostly Independent. independent and it's been a growing category, no party affiliation. This time around, you can see that from 2010 to 2015, which is the latest you can become a citizen, 76% um, are Republican. And that's new, that's new. They come in, they see the Republican party everywhere. That's one thing that Republicans have done. They have organized Cubans. They never leave South Florida, they know that what they have to do is not to, they don't have to win Miami-Dade County. They just have to cut down the margin of victory by of the Democrats. And they've done that very, very well. So uh, they've organized and they've organized the new arrivals particularly well. There's a new dynamic here. If, if you've uh, kept in touch with this, which is the Otaola um, phenomenon, where you have a lot of young Cubans that have come since 2000 to, and they are social media influencers and it's it, and that on top of the uh, re old republican guard and on top of constant republican uh presence makes for a significant resonance of the of the republican narrative it's not just in in, in radio mambi now that you can hear the, the republican narrative you can hear it on youtube you can hear it on twitter you can hear it everywhere and all you have to do is ring the bell the republican bell and it it's like in a church it echoes everywhere and that's what these young cubans coming in all these new cuban arrivals are in in now they, they they come into miami and and that's the environment but you can see that the born in the u.s only uh 40 percent are republic are signed up republican and uh the rest independent and mostly democrat and you, here you can see what I'm going to come to at the end again is that um, party affiliation over time, it matters who's in the White House. When you had Obama came in, right before he came in, it was 68% Republican. 
After that, it went down considerably below 50%. Now, since Trump is going in, it's, it's going up slowly again, 51%. Last time we did 53% now. Um, we'll see what happens in a couple of years if I'm still around to do that. Now, this is why I knew my poll was, was correct. And I, I, my, my methodologist, Ching Lai, Dr. Lai, and I worked on the methodology very hard. And once we saw this, this chart right here, we saw whatever it says, I believe, in terms of voting, because 90% of the populate of the Cubans said that they were definitely going to vote in the election. That's a very high number. And you're not, and that shows excitement. And unless you know who you're going to vote for, you're not excited to vote unless you know who you're going to vote for. So uh, there was a lot of excitement and there was only um, an unknown and 11% undecided and 8%, about 10% undecided up here on the second um, uh, bar. But the most undecideds were underneath, uh, were in the younger category. So there weren't many loose votes running around out there. and. Um, we, we estimate that that uh, Biden got a little bit more than 25%. I finished my poll in August, right before the, you know, last August. Uh, so there were 10% undecided then. So there wasn't, a, there weren't a whole lot of, of votes on the table. Um, but Biden had not come down to Florida once then, not even once by August. So. After that, he came a couple of times, Kamala, uh, Kamala Harris came. So they picked up, I think about 5% of those 10%, the Democrats did, but uh, Trump still got close to this 59% of the Cuban vote. Exit polls have it at 55 and 56. Exit polls are not probabilistic, so it's hard to judge by them, but they're within the margin of error of this poll. So I'm, I'm, I'd take it to the bank that uh, he got between 56% and 60% of the vote. And you can see that all categories said they were gonna vote for vote, except for Democrats, everybody else said they were gonna vote for Trump. Um, so yeah, that pretty much, when I saw that, I said, uh, I have a friend who worked on the Biden campaign and he called me up and said, we need 35%. And I said, you're not gonna get it. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe you'll get close if you hustle, hustle now, but uh, the 10% floating around out there, but I wouldn't bet on it. Um, all right, so that's the end of the data points. I want to mention a couple of takeaways that are guiding the way that I look at this from in the, into the future. One is, I showed you this chart before, is that leadership matters. And the more I look into it, the more I'm convinced that, um, that instead of Cubans influencing foreign policy towards Cuba, we play within the rules set by Washington. And that I think is significant as a takeaway because when I asked, uh, this is not that chart, but here you can see graphically how support for the embargo went down during the Obama era and was going up uh, during Trump era, um, and, and the same thing for the support for diplomatic relations. On top of that, on 2016, when I did the 2016 poll, and we asked, uh, which was right here, the lowest, uh, the, the lowest point of support for the embargo, I, around that bit of data, and the embargo is a very pregnant bit of, of symbolic data, um, is uh, it was the fact that 64% of Cuban Americans supported the Obama engagement, 64%. So whatever they thought about it when he started it up here in 2014, whatever they thought, he already saw the downhill slope here, but, um, but still what the point is, is that you change the rules, you build a new Cuba policy, they will come. That's the what now Biden probably is Cuba just isn't that important and it's not something he's going to move on immediately. Um, but still, if he does it right, he'll find plenty of support on the on the in Cuba in, in the Cuban American population um, for 
some initiatives that will be engagement prone. But the bottom line is it doesn't matter. I mean, that's what I, that's what I told. I even told the Bush advisors way back. I said, change if you want to change the rules, change them. The Cubans will be pissed off for two weeks max. And after that, they'll start to figure out how to make money on the island, which is what happened during the Obama years. Within two weeks, people had calmed down. Stores were opening in Hialeah that exported only to the island. A lot of parts, for Christ's sake, that's an example. I mean, people, the rules change, people change. Um, all right. And then this is the the other strong, the other takeaway. And, and this takes a little bit of unpacking. But the, the Republican Party is part of Cuban American identity. It's been so since the 1980s under Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, be, be, uh, before 1980s, when you read the Miami newspaper, there was, they did not refer to Cuban migrants in Miami as Cuban Americans. It was Cubans. The Cubans do this. The Cubans do that. I'm going through all the Miami Herald. I'm going through all of that stuff because I want to find a smoking gun. And I think I found it in the sense that during the Reagan administration, there was a party strategy strategy to target Cubans because there was a national party strategy for the Republicans to target areas where Democrats dominated, find a few good candidates, support them, and then cut back on the margin of victory for the of the of the Democrats at the state level. That is, they, the, the Republicans were interested in increasing governorships in the 1980s during Reagan, creating more governors that are Republican creating senators that were Republican, and those are statewide votes. And so they wanted to cut down on the margins of democratic victory. Cubans were perfect because then Reagan could enlist them and did enlist them to be surrogates in the Nicaraguan revolution, fighting against the Nicaraguan revolution and a lot of other revolutions that we saw forment being fomented by Cubans in Latin America. So the Cuban, so those are two pieces of, of things that I have found that solidified the, the, uh, the Republican Party and the Cuban identity. The third piece was um, in the Miami Herald in 1982, I believe there were there was a week long series on the Cubans, how the elite, the, the non-Hispanic elite don't know them, don't know who these people are. We're talking in 1982. Mascanosa. We're talking to Cuban American National Foundation and the Herald is spending a whole week explaining to their non-Cuban readers who the hell these Cubans are. And it says Miami doesn't know them, but they they're, they're, they pretty much run the place. And they talked about Mascanosa, how he can get an audience with the president. And, this, and it was like news. <laughs> it was news. And so you have, on the one hand, Cubans that are not being integrated into the system in Miami that were then integrated into the Republican party and pretty much became, it became their party in Miami-Dade County. Lincoln diaz Bollard, your know, name might sound familiar. He was a congressman, the second congressman select, elected in the area to Washington uh, after Ileana ross Letnan. He ran first as a Democrat, lost as a Democrat, changed parties in 82, won Republican uh, uh, primaries and elections until he retired in the late 90s. So, you have a real coalescence between the, the Cuban in Miami-Dade County, the Republican Party, and that doesn't go away. And the Republican Party did it by beating boots on the ground. They did not talk about Cuba policy. Mascanosa, who was interested in U.S. Cuba policy, gave money to the Democrats and gave money to the Republicans. So both Democrats, Dante Fussell and... <laughs> And uh, the, the, the names don't mean much to you, but people that the, the, the Democrats were against uh, the Cuban government and the Republicans were against the Cuban government. They both received money from Mascanosa. How they developed, how they uh, um, established the Republican identity with the Cubans is by organizing them um, boots on the ground. And I saw this live uh, real time when I was director of a labor center, I came to FIU uh, in the late 80s uh, as a director of a statewide labor center. I worked with the labor movement statewide and every single labor leader, Cuban American that I worked with um, 
was a Democrat. Every single representative in Tallahassee from the region was a Republican. Lincoln Dispolard, his brother Mario Dispolard, a bunch of them, all of them. All of them were Republican. And they worked together. They worked the ethnic card together. So the Lincoln Dispolard staff filled out the paperwork for unemployment of, of his, his, his uh, constituents, filled out the um, um, uh, travel permits, filled out the, the social security, and the, they nurtured the base. And so it was Democrats, Republicans dealing with a working class in Miami-Dade County. That's how they built the party. And they didn't talk about, sh should we invade Cuba or not invade Cuba? As a matter of fact, there was this big, this, uh, people were very unhappy with Ronald Reagan because he didn't do anything about Cuba like every other president. A lot of blah, 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 but nothing happened. Um, so, the, the Democrats have got to learn that. You don't come down here and want to sound more Republican than the Republicans. Just figure out what the hell you want for Cuba and go with it. So those are the two takeaways that I have from my, from my data gathering this time that I'm working on trying to flesh out through research, which is the fact that whoever's in Washington, you build the rules and Cubans will adjust. And number two is that if you want to get the base, if you want to cut really cut into the Republican identity thing with the Cubans, you've got to put the sweat and tears down here to organize the, the Cubans. I don't necessarily think that you have to address the Cuba issue every time you get off the bus to talk to Cubans. Um, the general takeaways other than the analytical ones that I, I'm working on right now are, are these. The community is divided on how to deal with Cuba. I cut and paste the uh, that from every presentation I've ever had, because they, they're always divided on how to deal with Cuba. Um, there's an increase in isolationist policy, Kidding. the embargo is on the rise, support for the embargo is on the rise. There is some room though, if you want to sweat the details for hope in the sense that there is a uh, support for airline services, selling food, medicine, ma maintaining diplomat diplomatic relations, designing the, designing policies that help the the Cuban American populate uh, the the Cuban on the island. Uh, and then I predicted that he would be on track to receive approximately sixty percent of the votes, and um, he did. And the, the the new thing that has to be countered, or it's going to snowball out of control for the Democrats is that the Republican Party is receiving an infusion of new energy from the most recently arrived Cuban Americans. And that has to be nipped in the bud or you're going to be seeing some Polo uh, Tiempo um, Futuro is not gonna be mejor as Maya would have, would have said. All right, that's it. Anything, <laughs> anything else we can answer in, in Q and A? Absolutely. Thank you, Guillermo. That's fantastic. There's so much information there. So I think we're all just going to decompress a little bit. Um, yeah, but you've and... got the, you've, you've got, be sure that, you know, you've got the, the PowerPoint. So share it as you see fit. And I'll be glad to answer anybody's questions through email yeah. or anything else. You know. That's great. That's really fantastic. So I am just going to make sure we are, we don't need to screen share anymore, do we? You can get rid of that unless you'd like to refer to it maybe in your answers. No, so no, no. I can, I can, I can stop sharing. You can improvise, can't you, with all of this? Yeah. Okay, there we go. Right, and we're back in the room. So I will just hand it over to anybody and everybody who might want to ask questions or get some more detail or rather get some more general patterns from such a comprehensive and detailed presentation. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Over to you, questions or thoughts. Can I have something? Yeah. Question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can I go ahead? Thanks very much, Guillermo. That was really fascinating. And I actually managed to follow it all the way through, which, uh, given that I'm colorblind, actually was potentially a challenge. But nonetheless, I think <laughs> the question I've got, I've got two actually. One is a fact question. The other one is the business of the, the one of the things you really astoundingly came up with is that, that indication of the strength of Republican support among the recent migrants. And I wonder, because yeah. I, th you 
posited that it might be to do with disappointment, uh, frustration, bitterness. Is there an element of those people, um, and those people perhaps more than previous ones, going to join families in Florida, in South Florida, who are already strongly Republican? Is that is an element? Is is that a possible influence there? And the other one is just a straightforward question. I've never been able to work out: Is the Cuban Adjustment Act still in force? Because yeah. wherever you go, the information differs. So, and that therefore does affect the wet, dry business and so on. Just that. Yeah, yeah. The, to, the, the last one is the easiest one to to, to answer. Is that yes, it's it's still in force. You just have to be here a year and a day and you can now getting here it's more difficult now granted but if you're here a year and a day then you can and you're cuban you can still file for uh if you can make it through the border however you get it here you can if you're not sent back if you because you do now you got to go before a judge and you have to do a lot of things that are before were automatic that you didn't have to do but if you're here a year and a day you can still apply it Okay. for uh, residency. So yeah, that's still in place. And yes, that hypothesis is as good as any right now. Um, and it actually is better than a lot because when I'm on the island, and I haven't been since the COVID thing, but um, one thing that fascinated me was that, and I, and I haven't tested it out on everybody I've met, but there is a, a and you can, when you guys go to the island, check this out, you can let me know. Folks say that the, the Cuban party is a Republican party, even on the island. Like what I'm, I'm there and then folks are pointing to, they say, well, yeah, when you go, but when you go there, like I, I, I'm in a, in a family situation in where one of the kids came to the United States and I was sitting around when they were talking about it, this is apocryphal, right? But still. Um, and the, the old lady said, yeah, well, as soon as you get there, you know, to find out who's running the Republican party and find, and how do you, you know, start talking to them. They're the ones that have the network. They're the ones that have the network. And that's from the island. That's sitting in Havana and Vedalo, right? You know, these people are talking like this. So I think that this family connection thing is, it has some fruit to bear on, on why this is the case. Uh, the the frustration stuff comes from uh, another colleague that I have who actually has been on uh, walking Hialeah and talking to people and and she has this quote about this Cuban that just came uh, a few months ago and said now Cuba is just one of those shithole countries he was quoting quoting Trump he says one of these shithole countries I have no I don't want to go back there and she's Cuban you know I mean he just so. There is a sense of bitterness that's that's there. Obviously, I don't know how um, how it, it layers over everything else. Since I look at structures and how these uh, memes are produced, right? How, how these ideas are reproduced throughout a population, the Republican structure is so strong here now that um, it is it is it makes the news. So that is that if, and plus they ha do have a network. This lady in the Vidal was right. That that's what during the Reagan years, that's what the Republican party did that benefited them. That it, it benefited Cubans to become Republican because it, if you were a business person, you made more money, you had the network. If you weren't a business person, you, you had the network to get a job. And I've been sitting in the office of, of um, uh, as, as an example that I would write down to, if it came to that in, uh, in the office of, of uh, Ileana ross Letner, and her staff gets a call and Ileana, such and such, her, her kid just graduated and they want an internship and they want to uh, be able to, you know, and he's a high tech guy. So they, they call, <laughs> they call. The, the, that's what I mean, you know, they built the base from the bottom up because they call the representatives and say, hey, and, and, they, and they figure the structure is there. So the structure of the Republican party, plus if you, if you start believing in it, right? It's like, you know, do you believe in the structure? Well, if you do, then it propagates itself. It recreates itself with every wave. And it's, that's happening now. And the other thing that's happening now, um, 
is the echo chamber of the Republican narrative is um, very loud in Miami. But before you had to actually tune in to Radio Mambi or La Cubanissima or you know, wacky radio, the QAI, you know, um, <laughs> wacky, WAQI, um, to, to listen and to get, to get it, to get the, the gist of the, of the exile narrative, right? Now it's on YouTube in a variety of formats. What Aola is the one that's milked it the best, you know, but there are a lot of influencers out there on YouTube. Um, and, and then you have it on um, uh, social media, which you never really had it before because the, the proponents of it were old guard. They didn't know what, it, what the hell a Twitter was. <laughs> Twitter account, like John McCain, big Google, you know. Um, so yeah, um, you're, you're probably right that the family thing is one of the main Correas, you know, that, that, that keeps us, uh, the, 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 um, the ideology, the exile ideology alive, probably. Thank you. Good idea. You're muted, Park. Other questions? Other questions or comments? Sara, you've got your, Sarita, you've got your hand up. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, hola, thank you, Guillermo, that was fantastic. Hola. Um, so I, well, one question was just, I, I might've missed when you talked about the slide for support for unrestricted travel for all Americans going down. Um, I had an interruption from a four-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> took my attention away from it. <laughs> um, but if I was, I just, that's crazy. And it's not that crazy as we can see from the slides, but um, if maybe you could say a little bit more about that. Um, and the other thing, there seemed in terms of, you said you were going to go speak to the, uh, give a presentation to the Democrats soon, which uh, is fantastic. And I think probably really important to see if it's possible to get them on board with a, good Cuba policy um, rather than just letting it sit on the back burner for the next three or four years or whatever. Right. And, I'm, and I'm wondering what you think about, there, there seems to be a discourse now in Miami. I'm not there, I'm in Los Angeles, so I can't tell exactly. It's all sort of social media based, but right. there's this argument that has emerged um, that that shows that people were disillusioned, Cubans, Cuban Americans were disillusioned with Obama's policies. And they sort of have this idea that Obama was had. He's been had, he's been tricked. Uh, the, the Cuban Cuban government um, didn't keep its side right. of the bargain. And, 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 and so that's where some of the, uh, I, you know, I guess the, the downward trend towards like engagement I don't know. I don't know what right. you think about that. If that's a real discourse, if that's something that um, can be sort of pushed against with the Democrats and like, look, that doesn't make yeah. any sense. These policies right. were only around for like two years. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right on, on, on everything <laughs> you said. There is, a, there is a, a discourse like that. There was, I mean, that discourse like was like the next day after Obama opened up, it was like, you know, like, ah, this is not working. I mean, it's 24 hours, dude. You know, yeah, it's not working though. And the, so the discourse was immediate. And, but the key is when it was that it didn't have a resonance that it, that it has now. But I, I think that, I mean, I, I used that. So I think that you're right. There's a, that discourse is there today and it might account for uh, some of the falling away of support for a lot of the engagement issues. You might, uh, especially among the older people, because in the 2018, when I, when I did the poll, I saw the trends moving already in, uh, oh, Sarah, we lost you. No, there you are. You just moved around on my screen. I thought you disappeared. Um, the, the trend in, um, it, it, against, uh, uh, against engagement started as soon as Trump stepped into the White House. And then by 2018, when I did my poll, I saw the trend, right? So uh, at that point in time, there were 53 or 54% in favor of the embargo. It's gone up now to 
uh, 60%. Um, but even then they wanted more travel and we'll, I'll get to the travel one in a second. The, so there was this trend already happening in 2018. And when I divided it up then between folks that came before um, 1980, that, two years ago, I did it before 1980, as opposed to 1995 now, uh, because there's a large enough number now after 95 that I can do that. But it, it, I, I looked at, are you in favor of the embargo before, if you arrived in 1980 or before, and every time, any time after that, or were born in the United States. And I noticed, and I compared it with 2016, when Obama left and everybody was kumbaya, 64% supported the, the engagement. Um, and I noticed that the people that changed their mind about the engagement policies of Obama were the folks, were the older folks, were the folks that had been here longest. So, and those were the folks that started the narrative that the Cuban government is not changing fast enough. It started, and it's, and, and so it kind of made sense to me that, okay, the old folks changed their mind. The folks after 1995 and all the, didn't change their mind at all. They were still anti-embargo. They were still pro-engagement. Um, so at that point in time, I had some hope. And then, then the, uh, the, the Trump train kind of, you know, took off and, and things happened. But so I think you're right. There's this narrative that says the Cuban government didn't change enough. Now, that's also a reality that Cubans lived in, in a way. That is, and, and this was explained to me actually, I mean, I, sociologically I understood it, but the way it was viewed by hardliners, it was instructive to have it explained to me. That was kind of what I know. He's been a hardliner all his freaking life. Um, and he said, yeah, you know, what I want is to go in there and want the people want more. I want to create a middle class uh, a middle class so that they'll, and sociologically, we know that that's how change occurs. You get a bunch of people that want more and they, and the government, they can't either give them more or, you know, you create polarities or whatever, but he was clear. He said, no, with Obama thing, we're going to go in there and create a middle class that then is going to demand more from the government and the government's going to have to change. So he had the strategy, right? That, that he was going to use the opening as a uh, as a way to change Cuba, and on the island, you had this boom in the tourist sector. You had a bunch of folks doing businesses that um, catered specific, that were if, if they didn't cater, they were boy they were created on the backs of tourism uh, and specifically American tourism. And I mean, this old guy might might be right that they created expectations that the Cuban government just could not meet, did not meet. And then these people then left and they're sitting in Miami stirring the pot saying that, you know, uh, screw that. This is, we, we tried that and now we, we, we're behind Trump. Now, all of these things, leadership mattering, the fact that, that there's the, this gruntle, that society doesn't change as fast as the individuals in it wanted to change anywhere. Um, the all of that kind of works together in the in the Cuban population. So I think you know I think you're right. I think that the one thing I, I, I should say though is that we expect Cubans uh, we shouldn't buy too much into this Cuban exceptionalism stuff because when when I finished the poll in, in August, I looked at the Gallup polls, across the country. And then I looked at job uh, performance, you know, uh, approval, job approval ratings that Republicans had of Trump. And I came away with, a, with the uh, realization that Cubans are only weird because they are Latinos and they're Republicans. Because otherwise they're straight up Republicans. They, they are mainstream, somewhat moderate in some ways, Republicans. On immigration, they're more moderate than other Republicans. On the COVID, so, so I, I looked at these numbers and um, Trump received 92% job approval ratings by Republicans nationwide in August, 2020. 
I didn't ask the the question directly like, uh, like that, but I did ask, like you saw, you know, you approve of immigration, you approve of race relations, you approve all these things. And, you know, you had a range, you had 60 some to 80 some um, range of approval, but nothing into the nineties, except I think maybe economy got 89, the highest. Um, and then the only question that I had to compare directly with the poll, with the Gallup question was on the COVID crisis. The, 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 the Gallup poll asked all Repo everybody, but I pulled out Republicans, uh, are, do you approve the job? Almost exactly like I worded, do you approve the job President Trump is doing in, in dealing with the COVID crisis? Nationally, the Rep Republicans gave him an 82% approval rating. Cuban Republicans gave him 83% approval rating. So they're Republicans and we got to get over it. They're freaking Republicans. <laughs> and, uh, and so they're going to vote Republican unless the Democrats do something about it, you know, unless they start to kind of say, hey, look, uh, both parties suck in terms of dealing with Cuba. It's not just us. You know, the Republicans have been around a long time. Look at Reagan. He didn't do anything. Um, so it's, it's time for the, the Democrats, if they want to, to step up and get back that margin, right? Because the margin in the state of Florida, unless they're willing to say, yes, Florida is it's a red state. And then Cubans don't really matter if, if somebody just decides to, to give up on Florida. If, if anybody decides to give up on Florida, then Cubans are totally unnecessary <laughs> to, to worry about. The reason people worry about Cubans is because you know, for two, a state that can be won or lost by 200,000 votes, Cubans can can bring eight hundred thousand to the party, you know, and they they get the girl, you know. So I hope I answered the question somewhat obliquely. You did. I'm just enjoying the metaphors, Guillermo. They get the girl. I'm just wondering what this. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I talk in metaphors. You know, everything's a metaphor. <laughs> okay. Other questions? <laughs> other comments? Uh, Lauren, go ahead. Liam, it's you. Well, you sorry, I thought you said Lauren, sorry. Um, so yeah, the, thanks for your talk, Guillermo. Um, there's a couple of questions coming in over Facebook. So I'm just wondering if you could answer those. So sure. the first one is from Michelle Chase, and she's asking, I, I, well, she, she's written, I often read in the media that the Republican Party's branding of Democrats like Bernie Sanders or AOC as socialists has helped turn a generation of newer Cuban migrants against the Democratic Party. What are your thoughts on that interpretation? Um, I, read the read. The, I mean, read the oh. last part again because I missed that part. Last part. Yeah. Um. So just she's saying the branding of Bernie Sanders, uh, AOC, right. and a lot of those uh, progressive wing of the Democratic Party as socialist is that turned a lot right. of, of newer Got migrants it. against the Democratic yeah. Party. Hi, Michelle. Um, yeah, the I, I I'm skeptical. I, I mean, I'll tell you why I'm s s skeptical. Is because um, we're always assuming that, oh, we, rightly so, that the term socialism resonates in South Florida more than it say it would be in West Virginia. And you remember that this this Republican narrative um, was a national narrative, right? It wasn't. They were hearing, hey, Bernie's a socialist in Iowa as well as they were hearing it in Indiana. It just has a lot of more of an echo effect here because of all the things I talked about before, all the different media, all the different outlets, and the fact that, that it's news here. You know, I, I, this is not the first time I've been asked this question about, the, about socialism uh, in South Florida. So on the, uh, that's true. And there is a, uh, keeping aside the fact that, that that folks are confusing socialism with all authoritarianism and all these empirical things that, 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 that really might not matter at all. It's just symbolically um, a historical baggage that that word opens up. Uh, I, I think that um, I find it hard to believe that a Cuban that has been around for 50 years, 40 years, really thinks that the United States can turn into a socialist anything um, due to 
um, the leadership in the White House. I, I now point out to people and say, look, you're afraid that that might happen, but look at what actually is happening, that you have a president that has actually shown the weaknesses in a system that before thinking about checks and balances, you could have, uh, people were always thinking, well, you know, nobody can be authoritarian because you have a checks and balance. Well, Trump has actually shown the weakness in the United States system, and I'm not the person to say that. And so in reality, you're, you're afraid of some socialist future that is extremely unlikely, but you're not aware of the authoritarian reality <laughs> that is happening right now. And I think that so I, I, I don't think humans are, are, are stupid in that regard. I think it's, it's just part of the, of the narrative, the Republican narrative that is echoed. And because when I actually poke people, and, and, and you can see it on TV sometimes when people ask, well, what socialism mean to you? And you get all kinds in front of reporters, you get all kinds of strange answers to that uh, from extremely racist to just uninformed. But when I asked that, I said, well, what do you mean he's going to be, there's a socialist uh, specter here? I said, well, I'm going to have to pay more taxes. I said, well, and, and that's a dominant bottom line to a lot of these folks, I'm going to pay more taxes, which is unlikely, number one. And number two is taxes are not a socialist uh, infiltration of a capitalist system that depends on taxes to, to build the bombs, right? So it's it's a, um, I, I'm studying this, and the reason I, I'm, I'm going around the way to, to, that, to answer Michelle's question is that I don't have a, a clear answer. I just know that when that I think feel that I'm, I feel that socialism was like a meme. You know, if you look at meme theory of how memes reproduce in a, culturally in a society, uh, that meme of socialism reproduces in South Florida. Like a rabbit. I mean, it really reproduces every and every, it's news. It's news everywhere it moves. That same meme doesn't reproduce in West Virginia with half as much uh, intensity. So you you have a a kind of a symbolic, it's kind of like embargo in a way. Embargo. Uh, the, the the question you support an embargo. I always ask it because it's kind of a hardline symbolic position, but when you break it down, you want to travel, yeah, I want to travel, yeah, you want to sell food, yeah, I want to sell food. You break it as to what the embargo is, and you find out people are all kind of supportive of, of certain policies that an embargo would would uh, negate, and it's changed over time, but I started asking this in the 90s, and I always got the same response. I'm embargo, but yeah, I want to travel, and I want to sell food, and I want to send this, and I want to send that, when the embargo was way, way tighter than it changed in the year 2000. So I think that socialism will always ring a bell. Um, and I don't think education will make a dent in it because it's, it's, a, it's one of these cultural memes that has a lot of resonance. But at the same time, we didn't hear it that much during uh, Hillary's because it, you know, they, they didn't use it. I mean, there could have been a progressive win for the Democratic Party. Uh, it really came to the forefront now because of the self um, uh, identification of a lot of people in, in the Democratic Party being democratic socialists. So I, I think it gave an, an, another dimension to the uh, ne Republican narrative, but anything in the Republican narrative, the only way to cut it down from its resonance in Miami-Dade County is to cut down on the Republican period. So. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna go to Lauren. Um, because you were waiting patiently. And then there's a question in the chat, Guillermo, that I can read out to you from Patrick O'Shea on Facebook. So Lauren first, go for it. Um, yeah, I wanted to go back to the question of the embargo because one of the questions was, um, do you support the embargo? And the, that was supportive. And then the improved economic well-being of the Cuban people was also supported. And I wondered whether that might be one of the reasons why, as you suggested, you could, people's minds could be changed by whatever leadership was in place. Maybe yeah. that's, that's one of the reasons why, if they, if they hold those two views. And could you kind of un unpack that a little bit more for us? 
Yes, I, I think you're absolutely right. And that's one of the um, bits of evidence that I have and I'm working on to explore a bit more, which is that since the beginning, and it's not just this, this snapshot is one snapshot, but I've got data going back into the 90s, people have always uh, supported a, um, a, a carrot and a stick approach. They want change. I mean, the bottom line is that every Cuban that I've ever met, I've ever known here or there, they want some change. They want change. They either want political change, they want economic change. Change is, is the word. And um, there is a recognition that the hard line has been ineffective in implementing the, some, the change that some people want. And so it, from the very beginning, you've had this kind of carrot and stick ambivalence about what policies will work. And Cubans support both. And that's why I think, and I think you've tapped into that, is that if you change the rules like Obama changed them, um, you're using the carrot, right? So if you can just just not listen to the people that want to hear the stick, they want to use a stick more. Because there is, a, you notice in those slides, there are some folks that are for the stick and not the carrot, and that's a small percentage. And there's some folks that are for the carrot and not the stick, and that's a small percentage. So if you just forget about those people for a while and do the ones that will take either as far as change agency goes, and um, and go with it. Do it because, like Obama did, because he felt it was a way to. He was a president of a country, not of South Florida. So he said, "If I change my my, my policy towards Cuba, we'll have we'll pay dividends in Latin America," which it did. And uh, so he did it not just thinking about Cuba. He did it thinking about U.S. foreign policy towards a region. And I think that that that's the way you should govern a country. I mean, you, you think about it in, in a broader sense. But what he did show was that leadership will tap into this need of the, uh, his leadership tapped into the desire. And it didn't take much selling. There was a lot of brouhaha, but folks settled into the new normals, maybe not in two weeks, like I said, relatively quickly. And uh, businesses started thinking about how to do things in Cuba in a very quick way, individuals did, supporting remittances shot through the roof. And and I asked the question in, the, in the 2016, how many of, of those remittances do you think went to develop uh, small businesses? And a lot of people said yes. So you had a change of rules, tapped into the, 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 the second question, the carrot question of uh, implementing policies that, that uh, are directed towards improving the, the economic health of the Cuban people, helping the Cuban people. And then you go on. And we wouldn't be having this conversation if Hillary had won. You know, we might be talking about how effective the Democratic Party is in, in South Florida, what policies really work in Cuba. We might still be hearing what Sarah said, that narrative about Cuban governments not reciprocating. We have a lot of other discussions uh, to to go into, but we wouldn't be one wondering about whether the Cuban Miami Dade Cubans would be involved in the island or not. I think that that's the one thing that um, Obama showed, and as a matter of fact, and it's something that I think needs to be explored. Is that in 1960? What was it? 62 when Kennedy was handed the flag from the Bay of Pigs. Uh, to today, Obama's been the only guy that has actually implemented policies that allowed Cubans, Americans in Miami, Cuban Americans to be engaged in, in Cuba at any level, invading it or uh, um, you know, selling a lot of parts. My phone's going crazy here. So I, I, I think you're right. And I think that that explains a lot of why leadership matters is because Cubans, if you have a narrative around why you're doing this, will uh, will listen to you. I think that the the the, the latest uh, pots and pans, uh, Trumpian uh, scenarios um, aside, I think in general, you, you Cuba since it resonates in Miami, but not in other parts of the country. But Cubans are also Republicans for other reasons besides just Cuba. 
I think you can kind of um, work with that. Thank you ever so much. And for your talk as well, it was really, really, yeah, informative, it was great. It is. Great. Thank Thankfully, you. we'll have the video to watch and, and study because there's just a lot to look at and so much ambivalence yeah. and so much contradiction. Um, and yep. on that note, um, before we go to Jackie, who has a question which she's put in the chat, but she can ask herself. So our question from Dr. Patrick O'Shea, who's uh, in Washington and on Facebook, and he says, Guillermo, it's in the chat if you want to read it, but I'll read it out. Is there data that helps to understand the motivations of younger generations and new arrivals to settle in the US as opposed to another country? It seems like not too long ago, there was data suggesting that younger generations and newer arrivals were less convinced by the exile discourse, but this data would seem to indicate the opposite. I wonder if there's a cultural shift that's happening to produce such a huge affiliation to Republicans by new arrivals in recent years. Any thoughts on that? Um, yes, I think that there, there are a couple of things that, that whether they're data or not, um, I don't, I think that what you get is the, the, the newer arrivals in Cuba are dispersing. I mean, they just have a lot of loud ones here in Miami, but they are dispersing. A lot are living in where, where the exile agenda, where the exile narrative is not as strong. And I think, so I, I think you're right in that. I think there's a, um, there, there's a community growing in, in Tampa, for example, in terms of actual people. There are a lot of going to New York. There's a dispersal throughout the country. I met some people in Portland. It's a small community in Portland, Oregon. So you have a, a dispersal and that, you know, we can, we can say that that might be a motivating force. The fact that they don't want to live in the capital del exilio, right? They don't want to live in, 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 the, in, the, in the entrañas of the new monster. Um, but the, um, there is a, a um, also, Besides that, because there is a dispersal, you can get that dispersal from the from the census. By the way, when you look at census over time, and I'm, I'm writing my little book on this, and I'm looking at some of that stuff, you can see where there's a there was a concentration of Cubans, and then a dispersal of Cubans, and then a reconcentration. But after they they arrive here, so the dispersal comes straight from the island, and then after a while in Iowa, they figure shit. I think I'll go to Miami, and then they come back. But they there is a dispersal. But there's also, I think, a cultural dynamic. And I think Tony's mentioned the family as a motivator for that. That might be the case. I have to really explore that. Next time I'm on the island, I probably will try to create some kind of uh, measure for that besides uh, just uh, Radio Bemba. The, there is a cultural change. I think that the, the new Cubans coming over, the new arrivals are way more uh, social media savvy than previous generations. I mean, like way more. Um, there, I mean, there's a guy who, who lives in, in uh, one of the dispersals. He lives in Louisville. I forget his name. He's got a one name. He's got he's got one name moniker, and um, uh, he does he, he Facebooks and he um, uh, has a YouTube channel. And, and there are a lot of these newer arrivals that have plugged into social media that in a way that um, has created a, a generational shift in the way that messages move around. And, uh, and then on top of that, I keep going back to my Republican party structure because I think it's hard to be in, in Miami and I, you know, hats off to or hair off or whatever it is you pick off for Trump. The, um, he's never left South Florida. The, the, the Trump mechanism was never, they worked the Cubans, they worked the Cubans. They created an environment where being Republican means something. What does it mean? It means you get quoted on the Cuban radio if you say something Republican-esque. You, uh, you, 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 you get interviews because you're a, a, a young Republican that just came from Cuba that makes you a vedette. So you, you do have a cultural um, dynamic that is quite different that, than the, the straight up 1990s, early 2000s dynamic of you came, and, and you can see it structurally. Those are the folks that, when they came over in the 1990, post-1995 folks went independent or went Democrat um, overwhelmingly. 
and the Republican Party shrank during the Obama years. Now, the Republican Party is going up, a lot of it on the backs of the new arrivals, and a lot of it has to do with the Republican narrative being, having this, the Republican narrative having a resonance throughout the community at levels it didn't previously have. Uh, and it cuts across age levels, and it, costs, it cuts across uh, occupational levels. And so, yeah, I think you're, you're right. There's a cultural change going on that I think starts might start back on the island to some degree in terms of just network. 70% of, of Cubans in Miami have relatives on the island. So um, regardless of the dispersal, the ones that are here, um, they might have somebody in Iowa too, but they have somebody in, Iowa, in, in on the island. And so that kind of communication is means something, means something. I mean, if you if you have a, a strong Republican party uh, family here, somebody comes over, they're plugged in to a Republican environment. Then you have to shake loose from that. And for many years, I, I saw that happening, shaking loose from the the, the ideology and the republicanness kind of disembedding itself because during the um, um, the Occupy movement, I went out in the street and I interviewed people and I interviewed non-Cubans and Cubans and anything in between. And the I found that, um, and everybody would give me a, a, a really anti-capitalist rap as to why are you out here? I said, why are you out here? Well, you know, too big to fail. My, my father wasn't too big to fail. He lost his job and these banks are pigs. Really strong ideological bent as to reasoning as to why they're out there. Then I would work my way down the survey, very short survey, about 10 questions. But the last ones were, are you registered to vote? Yes. And what party are you registered to vote in? Cubans were overwhelmingly, I'd say almost 99.9%. I can't remember a non-Republican one. They're all Republican, but they were out in the street on, on, on the Occupy movement. And the other folks were you know, a mix of, of Democrats and some Republicans, but Cubans were all Republican. So you have to. I, I, so there, I saw. Well, shit. You know, there's a, a, a decoupling of ideology and party. But none of these things are permanent, by the way. That's the other thing. I'll do. I'll do this poll in two years. Uh, I I hope. And um, I I'm predicting that if that if my leadership matter things has any any uh, validity to it, there'll be a shift, right? There'll be a shift towards a more constructive, perhaps engagement prone attitude. But uh, I don't think Biden is, my advice to Biden would be um, do anything you wanna do now. In four years, people will forget and they'll be either on the boat or they would have drowned. So you, you, do anything you want to do now. The reality is he's not going to do that because Cuba is not that important. They're gun shy. All these democratic reasons for not to do it. Um, so they might do re remittances, but I do encourage them to do remittances and flights um, and anything, and open up consular services on the island, things that are obvious that if you just do, you're going to get the support of 99% of the Cuban people uh, at least 70% that have relatives on the island, and uh, and then you can work it from there. But the crazier part of me says, just do everything now, man. Just do it in the first year. By the fourth year, nobody will care less. Cuba is not that important. Keep that in mind. That's, that's good and bad, <laughs> right? So if it's not that important, just do it. And, um, and what are they going to do? Not vote for you next time? <laughs> yeah, they already did that. <laughs> You already did that. Thank you, Guillermo. Okay, um, it's I'm kind of conscious of the time. It's quarter to seven, so we might be losing some people who need to go eat food or drink wine or both. Um, and so I'm going to hand over to Jackie for the last question. Um, just to remind you all that somebody who's here today, Dr. Sara Kosame, is our next seminar um, just over a week from now on the 9th of December. So check it out on, on Facebook and all the other places. She's going to be talking about agrarian reform, the results of her PhD and some postdoctoral work. So that's fantastic. But we're going to say, um, Jackie, over to you, and then we'll have a little bit of time to thank you. Yeah, so 
amazing amount of information. I'm so glad that it's possible to to download it and review it because yeah, um, and, and really, <laughs> really valuable. Um, and so much that is open to be interpreted in all sorts of contexts. And I'm particularly interested in um, the influence of the influencers. And because because and oh, Otto Aula has been like he's there every day. He's he's in everything. But, but even then, you've got people like Alexis Valdez, and and I mean the the population, the Cuban population, Carlucho, you know, uh, um, and people like Andy Vasquez, who I mean, whatever happens in Cuba, there's. Um, it's upset a lot of people and understandably, but they have been out and actually um, calling for Cuba Libre in Miami and taking part in the... Um, MSI. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. And and, um, and I just wonder, you know, do you think they actually have an influence on um, not so much the voting patterns, but the the thought patterns of the Cuban Americans. Yeah. yeah, they're they're uh sociologically important. They are sociologically important. There's a certain um water that they that they create where we all swim in it. And and the influencers are very important. There's a there's a funny joke by well, I think it's funny. It, it, uh, uh, you know, they two young fish are talking to each other and, and just floating there and one old fish comes by and says, hey boys, how's the water? And it keeps going and then the, uh, the two fish kind of look at each other and say, what the hell is water? And it's because they, you know, you're, you're in it all the time. So sociologically, yeah. that's what we, our culture is that. And they really shape the boundaries of what it means to be Cuban American in Miami Day now. These influencers, they they do have a an importance. Now, I don't, it won't be forever, and it won't be nothing's forever, right? But but they're significant. They really are, and and they're significant, like all cultural uh, creations, like all um, uh, stories that we create. They're significant because their their stories retold, like you're you're talking about it, you know, and and the media is talking about it and trump comes down here and uh, uh, mario diaz polar says hey you got to meet this guy with the because he's got uh, you know a lot of audience out there in that demographic that you really want to influence so trump sits down with Otaola and they have a, 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 a you know a, a kumbaya fest so they're very significant in that context there's a um a resonance, like I've said many times, of the narrative that before it didn't have a resonance among the young that was that accessible as it is now. So if you have uh, the socialism memes, a good example, you know, you you say socialism, and then if, if you if you wanted to hear in say ten years ago, if you wanted to hear socialism bashed in Miami, uh, you'd have to tune in to. Um, uh, Cubanisima or Radio B or something. You'd have to tune in. You'd have to go look for the people that you know hate socialism. But now it comes at you. It comes at you uh, from all these sources, and and it becomes part of the water that that we live in. And that's the influencers. That's the influencers because they're just like you said. It's, they're not just here. It's five to six. They're there and then they're recorded. And people, I mean, the only time I've never seen what they're all alive, but I just go to YouTube and I crank them up you know so it they're always there 24 7 and um they're significant jackie they're, they really are now how long is this fuse going to run before it blows itself up i don't know but as of today they are significant and they're going to get a little bit more uh significance in the near future because the msi stuff um the Movimiento San Isidro started with one incarnation, two rappers in San Isidro, and this happened. And, it, and then, so it's had one incarnation, but nothing in Cuba stays unmutated very long. So you have, 
when you have that incarnation, you have a lot of other different faith actors. I won't say bad faith, but different faith. Everybody brings their gripe to the to the meeting. So you have now a, a new phenomenon going on in Cuba, which is linked to what's going on in South Beach because people are texting back and forth. So in yes. South Beach and Calle Ocho. So you actually have, and those are the influencers. I mean, Otaola got gets locked up the other day because he leads this, this um, uh, event in Calle Ocho. And so that kind of symbiotic relationship has always been uh, the case in Cuba, but you have to go look for it. You know, I mean, you have to listen to the people call in to Pinar de Rios on Radio One B to hear the story. Now it's it's there because the the influencers are the the voice that picks them up. They they pick up the uh, what's going on in very real time. So yeah, they're they're a force. Yeah. No, thanks for your comments because um, I suppose. Um, and and they're like you say, feeding back to the MSI as well. So and 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 yeah, it's yeah. the young people that the it's it's That's two right. way, isn't it? Right. Yeah, I have I have friends on the island that are uh, leaders in a variety of of marginalized groups, and um, I mean they they don't appreciate to tell you the truth. I mean I. You know, they don't appreciate the involvement of what they hold on them because it kind of politicizes something that they would kind of just, they have specific issues they want to deal with, the LGBTQ community, et cetera. And so they have specific things that they want to deal with, and it's not helping that, they, that there's this now, uh, because the Cuban government then will then say, of course, hey, look, this is being influenced by, by Miami, and, you know, they're, they're right to a degree. So there's... It's not useful sometimes, you know, but that doesn't matter to influencers, right? They just want to influence. <laughs> they yeah. want to be the stage. Is that, I don't know if you saw that Jorge, and I can't remember it, how to pronounce his surname, the, the, the actor. Pedro Corrillo. Yeah, that's the one. Thank that's you. like chocolate guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, he, he actually um, said that he went to, well, he posted on Facebook that he, he got um, some of the people from the MSI to go and meet the vice president of, the, of um, vice minister of culture that I saw yesterday. Cool. Right. Yeah. You know, like you say, there are, there are certain real concerns, and particularly there's been artists, a lot of movements of artists. Um, the real concerns, and I'm, I'm suppose I'm interested in just the um, how how that's playing out, and particularly if there's a, an age sectorization, segmentalization, I suppose. You know, I, I do have the variable in the study. I haven't pulled it out. Well, I think I have, I just haven't posted it yet, um, of where you get your news, right? And I have social media and I have language. and I have, So that might be some interesting oh. stuff there. You know, if you want to you know, shoot me an email, if I ever pull that out, I can send it to you. Thank you. Yeah. So there is only one solution to this, Guillermo. We're going to have to invite you back in a couple of weeks after we've all digested your, your recent PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah, right, right. right. <laughs> and then ask the next round of questions. <laughs> right, okay. No, I am just kidding, but all thank right. you so much, really. It's just, it's yeah, been fantastic. Right. It's such a rich um, set of data and you've explained it so clearly to us uh, as a starting point. So we need to go away and do a lot of thinking. Um, okay. And, okay. So many things come from it as well, I think. That's the thing. It, it lends itself to so much interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary analysis. It's absolutely fantastic. So, um, Well, you know, I'm not going anywhere. Right. <laughs> That's good to know. Good to know. Thanks again. I hope you'll join us at some of our other seminars in the future, um, GMT. Yeah, uh, uh, and thanks from all of us. And thanks to all who ask questions and make comments. Okay. As usual. Thank so, you. Right. Hasta Thank pronto. You. Thank you. Hasta pronto. Hasta pronto. Palante. Palante. Eso mismo. <laughs>